thank, thank you very much. And uh, it's great to be here and to meet so many other enthusiasts into the subject of death, collective or otherwise. Um, as many of you know, um, I did a, a good deal of ethno-archaeological and archaeological research in Madagascar, primarily throughout the 1990s. And uh, in that time, my uh, area of focus was on the very south of the island, people who never practice collective burial, uh, people called the Tandrui. So I'm going to talk about them in part, but I'm going to put them in the context of all the other, or some of the other, myriad uh, groups and practices within Madagascar to try and highlight what I think are some of the key differences between single burying and collective burying and how we might start to explain them. Now, it is said that there are somewhere just over 20 official ethnic groups in Madagascar. There are many more, and the, um, the precise boundaries of those groups are, some th are things that have changed quite dramatically in, uh, in previous years. Uh, and whereas ethnographers have attempted to ascribe particular practices to particular ethnic groups, we know that the reality is often more complicated than that. That the groups, uh, so, so, so uh, a group, say, on the edge of one area might actually adapt ideas from, from another and so on, as you'll see in my presentation. Um, now, the other issue, of course, is that this is an island with multiple religions. And um, currently, uh, it is Christianity that has made enormous changes, sometimes in the funerary practices, but in many cases, not, and even not at all, as I'll show you uh, uh, later on. Um, it's, a, it's known as the Island of the Ancestors, made famous by John Mack's excellent book, uh, uh, published in 1986. And there's a fuller, earlier treatment by Raymond de Carre. And of course, there are so many ethnographies, of which, uh, perhaps from our point of view, the most famous is that by Maurice Bloch, Placing the Dead. Now, despite all the diversity, there are certain key themes. And one of these is that sacrifice is a crucial aspect of dealing with the dead, whether as ancestors or for the processing of human remains. So, uh, as the Tandri would say it, blood has to be spilt before you can open the channels of communication with the ancestors. Secondly, there are very strong concepts of pollution uh, that surround death and the dead. It's, it's a, a symbolically uh, polluting situation that people really seek to avoid unless, uh, unless and except for those times when they really have to. So there have to be elaborate means of spiritual cleansing to come through and out the other side of the, the, the liminality. And that liminality uh, is paramount. Separating the dead from the living is something that a great deal of effort and resources are put into. So uh, I think every, every ethnic group within Madagascar really shares those basic ideas. But the variations are many, and I want to present them as very much variations on a theme. These are tomb-building societies, by and large, and there is a simple formula, effectively, that collective tombs tend to be associated with people practicing endogamous kinship, marrying within groups, and notice, notably in regions where the main subsistence base is paddy field rice cultivation. And in contrast, the groups I'm going to show you later on are those that are cattle pastoralists with exogamous relations, where you don't marry within your lineage, you marry outside of it if possible, and, uh, 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 and where they practice cattle pastoralism, by and large because these are areas that are too dry for rice to be grown. Now, one of the most important aspects, well, uh, I suppose you could say that I'm stressing here, is what Bill Clinton said many years ago, it's the economy, stupid. Now, you may think I've suddenly regressed into a crude new archaeologist functionalist, but I haven't because what I want to explain is that 
whilst this might be the broad outlines, it's more complicated and it involves culture, religion and politics in terms of, uh, of, of, the, of the practices. And I want to give you a flavor of that as well. And just to start by kicking that off, the dominant group within Madagascar are the Merin. They live in the area known as Imerin, up in the central highlands. And of course, they are the classic group who practice not only collective burial, uh, but also this famadian, this secondary rite, literally of turning, turning of the bones. Now, the Merin serve as a kind of, well, well how would we put this? They're, they're, as a dominant group throughout Madagascar, they are respected, but also... Um, perhaps reviled is slightly strong, but they're, they're a group to whom everybody has very strong feelings because they are the powerful, uh, the, the powerful eth ethnicity within the country. But what it means is that many groups have reacted strongly in terms of emulating or opposing the kinds of funerary rites that are practiced. And what I'll do now is just say, uh, what I'll do is I'll take us on a very short trip throughout Madagascar to look at how those emulations and oppositions, to my mind, work. First of all, there's a key aspect that when you build a new tomb, you must never leave it empty because it will be hungry and it will eat people if it is not provided with somebody already dead. Um, we know about secondary practices and they are... Uh, not always appreciated by various other communities in different parts of the world. This is one of our uh, rather disgusting British right-wing newspapers which have persuaded so many people recently to vote to leave the European Union to give you an idea of how, uh, how uh, these uh, practices are sometimes seen uh, sadly from outside. But of course, they are richly... Um, uh, uh, and, uh, varied and, and, and interesting and intriguing. Uh, and as you can see, this is a case where corpses have been brought out from a tomb and uh, during a famadier in a secondary funeral. And in this situation, they are rewrapped and maybe a thousand people or more will turn up for such an event. They uh, will be drinking and feasting. The, the bodies may be danced around the village and eventually return to the collective tomb. Now, this, in fact, is a funeral for the father of a very good friend of mine, uh, who some of you will know because, for the archaeologists amongst you, you know the, the enormous contribution he has made to our understanding of the significance and purpose of Stonehenge. But in his everyday life, he is a collective burier. So his family buries collectively. Uh, he's uh, a, a member of the Protestant religion, but he's also of the Bazanzan ethnic group. So these are neighbors to the Merin, and they've largely adopted those Merin funerary practices. And here we are on the occasion of his uh, father's famadian, three years after his father died, and uh, Ramil and his brothers uh, 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 brought out um, the, the, his father and, and other corpses for the... Uh, for, for, uh, for, uh, the celebrations. Now, whereas we t uh, typify the, the Merin as indulging in collective burial, there are important exceptions. And one of those used to be with members of what was then the royal family. So that kings and queens always received single burial, such as uh, this one, Ralambu, who uh, uh, lived in the uh, late 16th, early 17th century. And there were other classes so slave classes who equally would not receive a collective burial. But I'm going to take us on a quick tour around the country now, and we'll start with some of the collective, other collective practices, and we'll see some of the situations that, that, uh, and how they're carried out. So first of all, moving from the highlands down to the west coast, sorry, the east coast of Madagascar, and we have uh, amongst the Bet Simasarak, uh, so-called many in inseparables, uh, where one of the practices is burial and then exhumation some years later of the dry bones and the placing them in collective tombs. 
And in that lower slide, we're looking at two bone boxes, the one to the east for the bones of men, the ones on the west for the bones of women. But the Betsimisarak practice other collective forms of burial, so particularly in the north of the Betsimisarak area, there is a practice where uh, within uh, simple wooden um, tombs, you have a large pit, and that pit is covered with large logs and planks. You can see some in the top photograph there. Those are removed, and the bodies are placed uh, as and when uh, after death, uh, as and when required. So there is no secondary removal of bones, as, as we've seen uh, for other Betsemesarak practices. Traditionally, because it's an area with re re relatively little hard geology, wood is brought in as a substitute for stone for these monuments. And today you'll find, for example, the extensive use of concrete, as in the tomb in the bottom picture, uh, which was built to replace um, a tomb which was sat underneath a large natural boulder. Now, we're going to move down the spine of Madagascar. So we've looked at the highlands uh, with the Merin. So the region to the south, the Betsileo, and whilst they have collective tombs, there are no secondary burial rites. Uh, though at uh, lunchtime, uh, Dennis was explaining that, of course, the northern Betsileo have uh, adopted the Famadian, uh, 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 like their immediate neighbors, the Merin. But we'll hear a lot more about this from, um, uh, from Dennis. Now, the important thing is that the Betsileo, collective tombs, no secondary, no Famadian. South of them, the Barra do the opposite. So they have secondary rites, but they are individual and single. They're not collective. So the body is placed in a rock shelter or in a small dry stone tomb, normally coffined, and then the bones will be retrieved and placed in another location, but they will always keep that, that second uh, uh, they, they will always keep that, that individual identity. And the Barra, of course, are in a region where there is no rice cultivation. They are pastoralists. Moving further south into the region of the Tandrui and uh, also the Mahafali and Karambula and also the southern Barra, they practice single burial but no secondary rites. So again, oppositional to the secondary rites that we see for the main groups of Barra to the north. In addition to that, a lot of the Tandrui identity is built out of opposition to dominant groups within Madagascar. And they will actually consider those that are not Tandrui, who come from other parts of Madagascar, simply to be foreigners. What this means is that they actually reverse many of the practices and traditions that are carried out by other, other groups. Um, they also traditionally have built the most extraordinary tombs, the largest structures, uh, and of course these are just, or in many cases, just for one person. So we're looking here at um, a tomb of, of a man named Fitohisa, and as is the practice in the south, on his death, his name is changed. This is all part of the separation from, uh, between the living and the dead, so that uh, his original persona is effectively overwritten and forgotten, and he, comes, he, he becomes known forever after as, uh, uh, as a second name given after death. And the tombs themselves are considered, through their naming, to be cattle pens, but built but built of stone. And looking at Fitohisa or Mandikarivu's grave, you'll see that there are cattle bucrania all around the top of it. There are, in fact, 180. And these are the cattle slaughtered from the moment of death until the moment of completion of the tomb. And in this particular case, it took four years for that to be achieved. You might think he was buried in this um, foreigner-style house on top of the tomb. Uh, he is not. He is actually buried below ground. Uh, uh, the house itself is merely a construction, an empty construction. 
So those burials start uh, below ground or on the ground surface. The blood of a sacrificed zebu is necessary to open up the channels so that blood is wiped on the surface to mark out where the grave will be. And then in the succeeding months and years, the cairn is built uh, as a rectangular structure of four walls. If it is a man's tomb, it has what is called a man stone, or in fact a pair of them, Fatulahi. The corpse, prior to that moment, has resided in the house. And when the tomb, uh, when the moment of death is ready, uh, uh, the, uh, the body is removed. And once in the tomb and buried, the place where that person lived and where they died will be set fire to. So it's a very dramatic event, uh, explained very simply by the fact that life is so transient that why have anything permanent when you're preparing for an eternity? And of course, your, your stone tomb is there to keep you uh, in eternity. Now, for the Tandrui, tombs are out in the wilderness, and they're places of fear, places surrounded by taboo. They should never be visited except in specific, ritually controlled situations. So, for burial or for cleaning ceremonies, the latter brought on by maybe visitations uh, during dreams uh, from uh, ancestors who are unhappy about their, their, their circumstances. Now, I've said something already about this permanence of the tomb, and that for the Tandrui, these are undisturbed resting places of the dead. It means also that they have a very strong fear of the living dead, of the, po the possibility of the dead coming back into the world of the living. And part of the rites of separation is to ensure that they are permanently confused and may never find their way home. Um, this permanence, of course, contrasts with a very mobile lifestyle. They are semi-sedentary pastoralists so that you may move from your dry season cattle camp to your wet season cattle camp uh, throughout the passage of the year. And in addition to this, there is a very strong symbolic loading on tombs that they are a place of sterility as opposed to the dynamics of human reproduction. And I'll come back to this theme of sterility because I think it's extremely important as a feature of these single burial practices in comparison to the collective ones. Let's just look at uh, some of the placing of tombs, though, in the landscape. And as with everywhere else in Madagascar, east is the direction of the ancestors. So tombs face to the east. But whereas seniority in Madagascar is throughout towards the north, in the south, it is towards the south. And additionally, the east-west organization of gender is, is exhibited in the fact that men's graves, men's tombs, are buried, to, uh, are set up to the east. There are strong gender differences amongst the Tandrui. And uh, just in these simple charts, this is some of the data I gathered. Uh, women never have standing stones. Um, that's not entirely the case in other parts of Madagascar where, where women may sometimes have these man stones, uh, but in the south, never. Equally, men's tombs tend to be larger, so on average, women's tombs are, are, not, are, are under 10 meters in size, whereas uh, men's will go up to over 20 meters. And equally, they're unlikely to have large numbers of cattle bucrania from animals sacrificed. Now, I've mentioned this notion of tombs being special, and it is not just the tomb, but it is the area around it. So these carefully controlled spaces, no uh, bodily functions should be exercised in their vicinity. No gathering of wild resources, fruit or firewood, never approaching as I've mentioned before. And also, the sterility of the tomb has to be protected. So there are cases where um, animals brought for sacrifice at the tomb, whether for cleansing or for, for burial, that someone has overlooked the fact that they still have their testicles and they have to have those testicles removed before they are sacrificed so that the, 
the, the sexual power of those animals does not interfere with the sterility of the tomb. Now in the south, the whole business of building stone tombs is recent. And this is a subject we've explored in some detail. So just over 150 years ago, all tombs were of wood. They're known as tseke, and uh, they are still built today, probably by less than half of the population, because everybody aspires to having a stone tomb. But to have a stone tomb requires wealth in the form particularly of cattle. Now, one of those various, very earliest tombs is that of a founding ancestor of a particular lineage, a man called Masiak, which actually means vicious. His name was, after death, became Mr. Vicious. Who knows quite what he did in life to deserve that. Uh, but he's a member of one of the middle-ranking clans, and it is this clan, the Afumarulahi, who actually initiated this monumental st uh, stone tomb tradition amongst the Tandrui. And they were built not in the center of the Tandrui kingdom, as was, but actually out on the margins, in the area where Tandrui were coming into contact with Barra pastoralists, and where there was competition over land. So effectively, these tombs were marking ownership of rights to land in these particular areas. As you can see from the format of Masiak's tomb, so his is the larger one in the middle there, number five, they are single, but they are organized in close proximity. But it was really only in the later 20th century that we saw tombs becoming what you might call small cemeteries of single burials. So this, it's still not uh, communal, so it's still not collective, but they, uh, they actually served as um, tombs for the patriline. Now, just why that happened, I'm not entirely sure, but it may just be that it is to do with changing relationships uh, within these otherwise polygamous family groups, so that in some cases we see sons buried in the same tombs as their fathers, uh, we see wives buried in the same tombs as their husbands, and so forth. Uh, it's specifically really in one area in the northwest of, of Andrew, and it's specifically associated with a small group of clans, notably amongst them that uh, clan, the Afumaralahi. Now, we of course were doing all sorts of other uh, investigations in Madagascar, and one of them was into uh, the journal of, of an Englishman who was kept for 14 years as a slave of the Tandrui and other groups in Madagascar in the, late, uh, in the early 18th century. And uh, we were heading down to the coast to uh, examine the shipwreck uh, where uh, he and uh, the English crew had been wrecked before the vast majority of them were massacred by the Tandrui. And we stopped off in a village where we'd been before and we learned that a former president of the local council had died, a man we'd met some years before, Tsiluza a man whose name actually means not dangerous. Um, Tsiluza had not only been president of the uh, local council, at a point in his life he'd also become possessed by a spirit, a spirit they call a kukulampu, a spirit of the wilderness. So quite an unusual individual. And his tomb was also particularly unusual because instead of the classic um, stone-built uh, rubble construction, he'd built himself a house-like tomb. And above the door, he had painted these words, humate tikange, we're all going to die. Or as Jim Morrison said, nobody gets out of here alive. Now, Tsiluza did indeed bury himself because he set out a series of stipulations because he said that he would be buried in a Merin-style collective tomb with a door, with room for future occupants to join him. Equally, he was to keep his life name after death, something unheard of amongst Tandrui. Thirdly, the tomb would not be subject to the normal taboos that keep tombs separate from everyday life. It would be possible for people to approach it 
to gather fruit and firewood in its vicinity without breaking any taboos. So these were quite momentous decisions. And he'd explain this by saying that he wanted to change attitudes and perceptions of his fellow Tandrui, not just theirs, but also attitudes and perceptions from other groups, particularly bureaucrats and administrators from the powerful group, the Merin of the Highlands. Because for the Tandrui, who, 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 who now range throughout Madagascar, and this is an enormous island the size of France, uh, where they're employed as security, they serve in the army, they work on plantations, and they have a reputation for ferociousness and uh, aggressive behavior. Um, I've always found them to be absolutely charming, uh, even though we were held hostage by a certain clan of Tandrui uh, at one point during our research. Um, they're patrilineal, they're patrilocal, and they're polygamous. And uh, that um, patrilineality is associated with exogamous marriage relations. Clans are ranked hierarchically from the royal clan downwards. So the aim of a, a young man is to marry as well as he can into a clan of equivalent or a r a relatively equivalent status. So that competitive clan relationship is something that powers this system of exogamous marriage. Compare that to what we see in the Highlands, where groups such as the Merin and the Betsileo and the Betsimisarak and the Bezanzan tend towards endogamous marriage practices. So, for example, in uh, uh, Ramil's uh, uh, ethnic group, the Bezanzan, cross-cousin marriage is the, the preferred form of marriage, and, he, and Ramil is indeed married to, to a cousin of his. They are monogamous, so only one wife at a time, and they may have bilateral as well as patrilineal descent. And of course, there is huge sense in this, as anthropologists have recognized now for many years indeed, because by being endogamous, you keep land together. And when it comes down to keeping that livelihood, control of rice fields, it becomes extremely important to hold the land as much as possible in common. Now, we know from Morris Bloch's work and subsequently that of course, there is a slightly fictive aspect to who gets buried in the tomb, because whilst the tombs symbolize links to the ancestors, they can be idealized that those buried in the tomb may never actually have lived together in life. But there's a more important point that I think I want to make. And whilst it is that, yes, economic resources are important, there is also another kind of resource that to the Western mind might not be seen as an economic resource. It is one in which the scarce resource is not the subsistence, but actually fertility provided paradoxically by the dead. And what is interesting is that these highland rice growing groups tend to have a much more developed sense of fertility and its significance as coming from the ancestors to the extent that women today will still fight over the funerary mats of long dead corpses in order to have sex on those mats or fragments of mats because that will, in, uh, that will improve their chances of conception. Uh, and of course this is very different to the Tandrui sense that the, dead, the tombs are a place of sterility, a, a, an important form of sterility in contrast to the, the, the reproductive uh, uh, nature of, of human and animal life. And I think this may also help to explain why these, some of these uh, collective rites require famadian um, forms of uh, intervention with ancestral remains, even though it's not something that the people I know regard as at all a pleasant uh, experience, something to be by and large avoided as much as possible. So that's what I would suggest is that yes it is the economy stupid but there's rather more 
uh, to understanding these subjects. And as archaeologists, I think we now realize the kinds of hypotheses we can put in examining why communal burials, why collective burial starts in certain places in certain times of the world by looking at that wider context. Thank you very much. Thank you.